Okay, great. Yeah, so that, that'll be helpful for me if that's um, okay with you. And then, oh, absolutely. Yeah. you know, just, just to be able to look at later. Yep. Uh, you can also, if you want, you can uh, turn off your video. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I need to see myself. <laughs> <laughs> no. I muted my mic. Let's see here. Stop video. That'll probably help with the recording, I'm guess, guessing. I would think so, yeah. It also saves bandwidth in case the internet gets slow. Oh, typo. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> No, I, get, I can't fix it, can I? Or can I? Uh, yeah, you can. I guess <clears throat> if I actually type in the right spelling, it would help, right? There you go. Like, and you, oh. so you do shift, enter, hold the key down and hit enter. Right. So that, by the way, that's in order, that's what's called markdown, which allows you some small amount of uh, formatting. Yeah. You can see in traditional and blur. Okay. And that cell is mar marked as markdown instead of Python code. So when you exit, it just format for you. Okay. Okay, so are we ready to rock and roll here? <laughs> sure. So the first thing to understand is that Python files are just plain text files. Yeah. Most of the time we see where there's this nice pretty color highlighting, but that's purely created by the editor. Right. You could create a Python file just using Notepad if you wanted to. Okay. So if you, oh, let's see, I need to request the. At some point, I also wondered if we could look at my file structure uh, or we could, if it's not working, we could s schedule a separate um, thing, like you said, but that's one thing that's kind of a thing that I don't, I've sort of done some command line before, but Windows command line gets me confused because of the location of where it puts stuff in the user files and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, if you're in the command line, you're back in the old DOS or Unix only mode where you have to use commands to right. move around directories, et cetera. So yeah, that's kind of pain in the butt. Jupyter Notebooks looks like it's a nice environment for doing stuff. Yeah, well, just a little background. The way we ended up here is that <clears throat> initially you only had simple editors and programmers essentially sat down and wrote a complete programs either for themselves or for somebody in the company. Right. And so they were big things. It was kind of a slow process. You ran a full program, you made sure it worked and handed it off. Yeah. Today, things are much more interactive <clears throat> because a lot of times you, you want to try something with data, see what the result was, and, and decide what you're going to do next. Yeah. And so that's why we've evolved to where we have editors like Jupyter here where you can execute a few lines of code in a cell, look at the results, and then do some more. And Jupyter also allows you to go back up, tweak a cell, and rerun it to maybe change what, what you're doing here. So you're talking about basically live runtime prototyping within a notebook environment for like, instead of staging and launching and executables and whatever, just kind of live testing sort of modularly? Yes, it's okay. a very incremental, real time working with things. Okay. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know. I, one of my favorite things about the book so far, Python 101, is I did not know. I should know this, but I did not know that Python was named after Monty Python. I didn't know that. Yeah, Guido, who developed it, loved Monty Python. And so you'll see a lot of references in. Python module names and <laughs> documentation that refer to that. In fact, the <clears throat> Python itself comes with its own small, nice little editor. Hey. And, 
which is called IDLE, uh, Integrated uh -huh. Development Environment. Integrate, in fact, I don't remember what the, the acronym, but obviously it's, it was, <laughs> uh, it was after uh, Eric Idle from Monty Python. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah, you'll see a lot of that here. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a simple, simple example here. And as, as you saw and ran, you just do a shift enter and Jupiter will execute this. Execute and will, for instance, here is just executing a, a print statement. Oh, plot. I see. So <clears throat> shift enter executes the code in a given cell. That's right. Yeah, you can go ahead okay. and try it if you want. Is it okay if I try it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fun. Hello world. That's awesome. <laughs> yep. Um, actually, you'll see this a lot. This is has become. This is supposedly the first thing you're supposed to do in any new programming language you pick up, is you figure out how to print "Hello World." Yeah, it's not. I mean, that's that's a perfect example of like, I didn't. I did it before once because I think I had a mobile app that allowed me to do some Python or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I did it. But when when I think about hands-on exercises, can't get any simpler than that. So I, I think that's the kind of thing that helps you feel like you're accomplishing something. Yeah, you you actually are making something happen. Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> indeed. So as we're talking about editors, so ID they refer to these as IDEs, integrated development environments, which essentially mean they're fancy editors designed to write programming code. Right. And nowadays, normally a lot of editors are have tweaks to be used with Python a particular language like Python. Yeah. So they know about all the statement types so they can highlight it. So you get color highlighting. Now the other thing that's different is that these IDEs will also in here allow you to execute the code and see the output from your program. That's pretty nice. All in one place. Whereas if you, for instance, if you went over, well, let's see. So I think I'm going to get to it here in a second. A long time ago when I programmed, I'm not going to say what computer it was or what year it was, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you would just type in the lines of code and then hit run, I think. That's right. Yep. First, probably basic terminals. Yep. It's hard to believe. I'm old enough that in college, we actually had to type out computer punch cards one per line, take the stack of the deck of cards over to the computer center, turn it in and come back a few hours later to get our printed output. That's you pretty imagine. fantastic. I think I was reading, I don't know if this is true or not, but wasn't like the first computer technically like a mechanical thing and that's that's how it was programmed was the punch cards? The, yeah, the very first, uh, <clears throat> yes. In fact, the they, they come from the Jacquard loom was the design of what, you know, the cloth, the designs in that cloth were programmed using punch cards. <laughs> That's and nice. so, yeah, the first guy to automate programming just said, eh, what the hell, use the same punch cards. So it was for fact, weaving, I, like literally, I thought it was, yeah, I'll have to read up. I thought it was like Charles Babbage or something, but that makes sense that loom, that weaving would require a pattern and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, so you it, you actually program those so that you could repeatedly get the designs in the cloth that you were producing. I don't suppose you've ever seen some kind of, I don't know, simple Python exercise where you can do like a very simple 8-bit graphic or something like that? Um not well there are there are there are modules like pi game that let you do that kind of thing okay there's I'll also in the graphics a lot of times they teach particularly younger learners using something called turtle i've heard of it yeah so it, you get it's kind of a little robot on the screen yeah so you tell it which direction to point and then how far to move and kind of a pen up, pen down, 
which is is more interactive and more visual than than just programming statements. Yeah, that makes sense. So, just like before, we were doing the same thing. So, in Jupiter, I should have actually added some other ones. It, well, so the idle editor that comes with Python is a little different than Jupyter. In Jupyter here, you can put multiple statements in a cell okay. and execute all of those statements. In idle, you enter one statement and when you hit return, it executes just that one statement. Oh, okay. And those, by the way, are called REPLs, R-E-P-L, read, execute, print, and loop. Right, so and you call up the program by typing in Python, which calls up the language module and then the specific file. Well, in, in idle, when you start it up, it's, um, and you can act, there's a, a similar thing in, from any terminal, you can start the Python, they'll call it the Python interpreter. Right. So then this is purely Python. So you type a statement and hit return, and it'll execute just that one statement. Okay. And I actually keep idle open on the side on my desktop all the time because it's, it's very handy to check statements. Even if I have my big editor open, it's sometimes it's a little easier to, to play with things on the side and then go back to my main editor. Okay. So in the terminal, what you would see once you've written a program, yep. you can go to your terminal, no matter how you, develop the Python file and you would run it by just typing Python. So you have to tell the operating system what program to run. So in this case, you're gonna run Python and then you put the name of your program file. Does that assume, that's one of the things I wanted to take a look at at some point today if we have a moment is, like if, if we say we made a an actual Python program that was just the hello world statement, but we put it in a file. Mm -hmm. Does that command right there assume that that file is in the same folder or let's see. So like what happened? So ahead. what happens is Python has a, a list of places. It looks oh, the okay. first place is local. Okay. In the directory that you're sitting in when you run this command. Okay. If it can't find it there, then it will go to all, every operating system, Windows, Macs, whatever, has something they call a path variable. Yeah. And you can open it up in Windows. And it goes down that list of directories and looks in each one of them, hunting for this file name. Okay. I think what happened is in the instructions for Anaconda, they actually recommended when it was installing uh, not to add the path variable because it would cause problems. They didn't really explain why, so I didn't, but you know, sometime yes. later today, it would be helpful to look at, at, just so that I can understand where to find stuff. Sure, yep. Well, the reason is Anaconda installs its own Python system. Okay but you are also allowed to have and often do have or sorry python installed separately okay and so then when you're running python if you also add anaconda to your path it's it's not clear which python you're going to end up running oh okay so that's why they ask you to avoid it and okay. for instance on max max come with python already installed so that's awesome yeah Okay, so inside Python, there's there's roughly four major types of objects, simple okay. objects that, that you're gonna see in a program. So the first one is our comments and you create comments by just having a, a pound sign up front. Yep. The next one is text strings so they hold 
text that Python completely ignores. It doesn't care what's inside a, a text string. Okay. And to tell Python that this is text, it's not a variable or anything else special, you use quotes around it. Yeah, okay. And they, they can be single quotes at either end or double quotes. You can even have triple quotes, which allows you to put uh, return statements. You can have multiple lines in a single string. So if you said something like, hello world, without doing the print statement, it would say, it would like basically, and then you do a shift enter, it would say invalid syntax because it, said, it thinks you're trying to execute a command, correct? Yeah, exactly right, yep. Okay. Yep. If there, so if there are quotes kind of, around it, it says this either must be a Python statement or a variable. And it doesn't really matter too much what type of quotes you use? No, it's just a convenience. If you've got an apostrophe in the string, it's obviously easier to have double quotes. On the other hand, if you had, you know, in your text, you were going to have the a book title, Moby Dick, in double quotes, then you can use single quotes around the, the whole string. Okay. So it, either one, Python doesn't care. And by the way, the the quotes are just indicators. If you, for instance, later ask for the length of this string, yeah. this text, the quotes don't count. Okay. So the, the next major item in, in Python here is going to be numbers, which three flavors, integers, floating point numbers, which have a decimal point, and complex numbers, which, you know, unless you're doing something really mathematical, you usually don't get to. Those have a real and imaginary part. And one of the interesting things about Python, at least it was to me from coming from a language like C, C, you have to tell it how long, how much memory you want to use for an integer, uh, yeah. which can be from one byte to like eight bytes. Wow, really? Yeah. Yep. Python doesn't care. They, their integers now can have any number of digits you want in it. So, so you could literally fill up memory. Right. So you could, you can put in an integer representing how many inches across the universe is, and Python's quite happy to have that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So the last and probably most important <clears throat> type of thing in a, in a Python program is going to be variables. And in Python, variables are simply names. Right. They're just an identifier. So I could say like bill equals one print bill. Yep. Oh, syntax bill. error. Yeah. The, the print is, a, is actually a function, so you have to have parentheses around whatever you're wanting to print. Do you have to put the, the value in quotes or, oh, I see. No, numbers, yeah, okay. Nice. Yep, so, that, so here, bill is set to the integer or value one. If you put quotes around it, then that is, just a string. Okay. And you can see it's, you have to be a little bit careful when you look at things. When you actually print a variable that's a string, Python doesn't put the quotes around it. Oh. Because it, it assumes you're really kind of talking to the user and they don't want to see quotes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the other important thing about Python, particularly versus other languages, is again, since variables are simply pointers to some object, the variable itself doesn't contain a data type. Okay. So you can have 
bill point to the string and I can turn around in this line then and set it equal to a number. Okay. Python doesn't care. Which is unlike other languages like C that you actually have to declare what type of data their variable is going to point at. So when you're creating a variable name, the, you want to play around there for a bit? All right. <laughs> no, okay, okay, so, right, gotcha. So um, variable names are basically letters, numbers, and underscore. Okay. Except that you cannot start it with a number. Oh. It's, Im <clears throat> it's important to remember that Python is case sensitive. Okay. However, the syntax guidelines for Python suggest that regular variable names should all be lowercase. Yeah. And if you want kind of the multiple words in a variable name, you use an underscore to separate the words. That sounds similar to like HTML web page names where like if you do it uppercase or lowercase or spaces, there it's better to just have everything lowercase. That's right. Yep. Yep. And that's called snake case, by the way. Snake if case. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Up and down. Camel case is used elsewhere and C tends to favor this. That's where you just you don't use underscores. Oh man. So you, you do it like that, use capitals to actually separate the names. Okay, fair enough. I guess it's more quote unquote efficient because it takes up less space. Uh, yeah, that's probably where it came from initially. Um, and it's, it's now suggested to use as long and descriptive variable names as possible. Yeah. Partly because you'll notice here, if you, on any decent editor these days, if you type a few letters from the, the start of your variable name and just hit tab. Ah. Uh, come on. It'll kind of help you out, right? Yeah, it's. Maybe we have to run it. Oh, I thought we did. No, it didn't. Did we run it? Maybe we didn't. It could be like my browser has something weird going on. Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. I, yeah. I just hadn't executed. Kind of like autofill, auto type, and all that stuff. Yes, exactly. Yep. So there's there's now no reason not to have good descriptive names. And secondly, the one thing you do have to be careful of is that Python, as soon as you type a variable name, creates it. And it doesn't do any checking or whatever. So if I misspell this, Python says, okay, that's, that's a new, <laughs> right. that's a new variable like it, name. It's dumb in the sense that it does exactly what you tell it to, but doesn't always check it as, uh, up to a certain level. That's right. Yes. Yep. And I have to tell you, the, this type of error is really hard to find. So there are some editors, uh, Jupyter doesn't do it. There are some other editors that will put a little flag over here on the left telling you, hey, I've only seen this thing once, which gives you a hint that maybe you misspelled it. Right. So that's why, uh, back around to what we were saying, that's why it's frankly better to type a little bit and hit tab so that you Less don't typos. risk misspelling. Yeah, so you don't get typos in there. It, 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 some of these things it seems like falls into what kind of feel like, I don't know, coding etiquette or etiquette or whatever. My friend is a coder and he would explain to me sometimes. And, and I would sit there and kind of look over his shoulder sometimes when he was working on stuff and working on like, um, you know, program and the very smallest typo, you know, misplaced period, whatever, 
would uh, <laughs> cause problems. So I can imagine with millions of lines of codes, why there's so many issues in programs today. Oh yeah, <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Yep, that's definitely, definitely a problem. And, and some, people like, some people like the strictness of programming. Yeah. Other people, it, it just drives them insane. Yeah. Uh, and why they can't stand programming. <laughs> and that's right. one thing nice about programming. It is really a strict mistress. You have to get things exactly right or it, it's not going to work. Yeah. So just a quick aside here. So there, so you've got these objects, which can be strings and we'll get in later to other types of objects like lists and dictionaries. So there's two ways to call functions on those. So the first way is you give the object name, a dot, and then the method name. Okay. So that method name only applies to the data type that's in front of it. So we can uppercase What would be like the simplest possible Python function? Simplest. Well, we'll get to that. Oh, right sorry. To next. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and also I, I, I need I to trust in your pedagogy. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's good. You're running along the same line. So the one thing to note, by the way, is Jupyter will print the result of the last statement in the cell, okay. whether you use print or not. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Kind of an automatic thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I guess it can be, can be helpful. So this is, this is where you have a method that's attached to just one data type. There are other, what they're calling built-in functions, I mean, they're already defined. And in those cases, you have the function name and then the object in parentheses. And I kind of wish they didn't do this because it, it's now you've got kind of two syntax representations, but I guess it does make it a little easier. And th those are simple things like length. You can put any, any variable in here, a string or a list. Absolute value. You can also do a sum. So basically like length would be if for some reason you needed to know the length of a string, like how long a word was, like you, in one line, you could declare a string. In the next line, you could use the len command. And then would you have to print it out or would it automatically declare that? Well, if, if you did, if that was the last line in the program in the cell here, it will go ahead and tell you. It oh, the okay. Result. Interesting. <clears throat> if you're going to have, obviously, if you're going to have multiple of these statements, you know, if you want to see the result from this absolute of minus three, since it's not the last statement anymore, you'd have to use a print around it. Gotcha. Okay. Fair enough. So, so this is one of the important things that sometimes books and whatever go over. There's particularly when you're learning Python or any language for the first time, there's, there's just so much to memorize. Yeah. I find the most important thing is, okay, well, how the hell do I go find out the methods <laughs> right. that I'm going to deal with? Yeah. So for the built-ins, this is the list and you can, you can do this. I gotcha. A DIR of this underscore to get. I'm just going to take the mouse for a second and uh, make a note of that. So just out of curiosity with this, with this Jupyter notebook for 
Python 101. Did you say that, that these files are available with the book or did this, is this something that you created? No, I developed these. Okay. I mean, because it's very nice, just some feedback, because this is exactly what I was hoping to do is to be able to try some things live. So I think it's it's great, even though there's a typo, but you can pay me $100 for that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I did that because I found as if, if the previous book I was using as I worked with students, a lot of times you'd explain something and it was, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they later they ask some question, making it clear they really didn't understand right. what you said. So yeah, the interaction helps. So Jupyter is perfect for that kind of and, thing. And the reason, so in Python 101, it, it goes and says, here's IDLE and, and whatever, and explains that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're using Jupyter, I'm assuming, is partly because of ease of use, but also for um, for like a remote tutoring session, it's easier to spawn it in a browser? Uh, that's how Jupyter, browsers be, became so ubiquitous that it was the easiest way for Jupyter to give you output and get input. Right. Okay. Then they don't have to worry because unfortunately, Windows, Macs, and Unix all have different systems for creating these windows and text boxes and so forth. So is this Jupyter calling the Python on my computer or on a cloud server somewhere? No, this one is running on your server. Interesting. All right. Yeah, so one of, the, one of my goals someday off in the future is to try what I think is a Jupyter notebook, which is a thing called Collab that Google has where you can try a program TensorFlow. And I think what they did yes. is they connected Jupyter notebooks to a live instance. And I think in that case, it's over the cloud. So you don't have to install everything locally. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're, they, they have so much compute power that as long as you're running small stuff, they don't care. <laughs> right. Now you're at that, you know, if it gets busy, your program may, be slow or take a little bit to run, but yeah. Okay. Even more interesting is in the case of TensorFlow, that often you're gonna want to be running it on GPUs, not just your regular plain CPUs. Yeah, and okay. It, it's nice they have whole banks of very fast GPUs that they allow you to run that on. That all generate heat and suck up electricity, thank you Google. Yes, they absolutely do, yep. <clears throat> Most of them are at least trying to be carbon neutral by having yeah. solar panel cells everywhere, but yeah. So the DIR is also very useful for any of the other methods that you want to use. Okay. So if I want to know all the methods of a string, I can just put a string example in here and I get a full list. Now, fortunately, I or Jupyter here also allows you, I can just have, for instance, a string, I hit a dot, and then if I hit tab, come on, it will pop up a list of methods. So what is the ABC function? ABC is just some string, any string oh, okay. at all. Gotcha. So it's basically, is it a sort of a way of saying equivalent of star dot star? How do you mean star dot star? I just didn't quite understand what a, so basically ABC as you just typed it is arbitrary text. It doesn't matter. And by pressing mm -hmm. tab, whatever you type in, it can automatically append the dot whatever to it. Is that right? Well, what this is doing is once I press dot, then clearly I now want to put a method that can work on a string. Okay. But the question is, okay, what methods are available or how do I spell them? And so that's why if you hit tab, you, you automatically get a list. So you don't have to go off and Google Python strings. I see. So in this sense, you're not calling a function you're typing in a string and the methods that come up can modify the text or do something with that string. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right. You can come down here 
select one. Some computers you have to hit tab, some computer you have to hit enter. And even nicer, once you've done that, then the question is, okay, do I, what kind of arguments can I give this? And if you do a shift tab. Okay, hold on, shift tab. It didn't work for me. Didn't work here either, and I don't, sometimes this thing works, sometimes it doesn't. No problem. That should, should give you the set of arguments. I see. No problem. I, I understand the concept. It's like yeah. learning these kinds of things are what is helpful as you're building code and you're trying to look something up that you don't quite remember or whatever. Yeah, even for me, there are times when I don't remember. I remember there, there are functions, but I can't remember whether they work on strings or lists or both. And so right. this makes it very nice to be able to check. So for instance, count, we can tell it. Okay. Ask it how count how many T's there are and then <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. But where was I going? Yeah, so I was what I was going where I was heading was if I ask for the directory of a string, that's another one. Oh, actually we did that. I guess it was the first thing. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I understand what you're saying. So the, and by the way, the, all of these with an underscore before and after are internal methods. Okay. Which typically you don't worry about. And by the way, since these have a double underscore in front or back, these are called dunder methods. Okay. So let me... <clears throat> Which um, which chapter is this? Um, is it two? Yeah, I think it's it's two or three. I have to look. I started doing this on first edition. Chapter one, Python editors. No, uh, so it's actually chapter four in the new second. Oh, that makes sense. So I assume you got the second edition, the blackboard on the cover is black. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's nice. Would it be possible for us to take a few minutes to, to just take a look at what the Jupyter Notebook would be like for chapter 35? Chapter I need to go to the message thing. Um, well, so in, in Jupiter here, so it looks like by the way that you started up Jupiter instead of Jupiter Lab. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I tried adding a um, like a taskbar icon, and then I just kind of ran it. But but I have uh, I know you told me how to do. Yeah. So you want try navigator. Navigator. Top, that's it. Top gotcha. thing there. Thank you. Never actually tried running this simultaneously, so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, we can stop the other thing. And, and there's quite a bit in the background, so it takes it. And what is Anaconda? It's a it's a distribution of Python, or it has certain libraries, or. Yeah, that's the nice thing about it is <clears throat> it comes with several hundred of the most common Python modules. Okay, gotcha. 
So it avoids having, you know, suddenly you need NumPy. You don't have to go install it. Okay, gotcha. So I guess that's... Okay, so, so here you get a selection. If you select the second one here, Jupyter Lab. Oh, do I have to sign in? No, you just have to launch. Okay. Jupyter Lab <clears throat> apparently is sometime soon going to replace Notebook. This is kind of a better, more advanced. So one of the things you'll note is you open up more files. They don't open to tabs in your browser. They've got this local area that it comes up in. Yeah, gotcha. So if you click the <clears throat> that top Python 3 notebook icon, okay, so that gives you a new, a new fresh notebook that you can play in. Okay. So if you wanted to do web scrapey things or whatever, <clears throat> right. you can type in here. Okay. That's where you would put it. All right. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, is that something that you've developed a Jupyter notebook around or would it be more of kind of a live practice thing? Yeah, I haven't, I just switched over. I just like a month ago decided to start writing these notebooks. Okay. No problem. Own, so I've only done the first, I think three notebooks. Okay. Uh, so I'll take a shot in between now and the next lesson at just sort of exploring that chapter and seeing how mm -hmm. far I get before I'm in over my head. And then, um, and then we can, you know, we can just continue with, with what you, you know, would recommend as far as the, you know, the sequence of things. Yep. So, and by the way, <clears throat> if you're going to do web scraping, what that involves is, <clears throat> running usually it's a request command okay in python which sucks in all the html from a website okay and then then you've got all that as text that you have to figure out what you're going to do right <laughs> okay yep so i'm just going to run over kind of lightly about strings okay so one of the important things to remember is that strings are immutable. Once you create a string, that's it. You can't insert things or add to it okay. in that single object. And the reason I bring this up is that when you run a command like replace, that certainly would lead you to believe that it's changing your string. Okay. What this is actually doing is it creates a copy of your original string, does something to it, and hands you that new string. Interesting. And even more confusing as Jupyter is it will it will show you the result of that command. So you go, oh yeah, there it is. It's if I run this. If I run this without the print, uh, you say, oh, excellent. That's exactly what I wanted. Right. But now, if I say, okay, what's S? You see, it did not change S. That sounds a little bit confusing. Me. Yes, it is. So if anytime you're using a command, normally what you're going to end up doing is you need to do, if you want to use the same variable name, Okay. You just, you just say s equals s dot replace. Right. So I see in the comments it's a modification rather than the original. So instead of doing that, it might be better to just say if you want to change it, s equals this instead of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So string methods. So actually, we we already covered this one. Did you ever play one of those? Um, text adventures back in the day? A few times. I wasn't hugely into games. Yeah, that's fine. I remember playing one one time and, and I could imagine, 
a project at some point once I learn how to do Python is having it where you can where it's kind of like your narrator's telling you what what room you're in then you can type in mm -hmm. a command like pick up sack of gold or whatever oh yeah and there are, in some sense there there's a resurgence of that in programming because in a lot of AI classes uh, particularly where you're going over search methods yeah they use text games like that uh, interesting where you program an ai to move around in a room to find gold and ah. try to get the highest score and all of that interesting so it's kind of like you're automating the character in the game or something that's exactly right yep yep uh so just quickly you can use a plus to stick two separate strings and make them one string. You can use indexing here to get, so if we comment that out, we can see that that returns. And the one thing to note in indexing, so this is important and applies all over Python. Indexing always starts at zero. Okay. Not one. So in indexing, is that kind of like a matrix where you're putting more than one value into something? That's right. That's exactly right. And this works because Python, most of the, in most places, treats a string as an array of characters. Array, that's what I meant. So basically, it's like floors of an elevator in a hotel, and on each floor, you put different values. What for a simple, if there is a simple example, what would be a, a reason why you would use an array? Like, do you, is it for In, storing numerical information? Yes, because you often are, yeah. So an array is a collection of items. And in a list, for instance, they're ordered. So you can use an index to select which item in that collection you want to work with. Okay. And if you think about it, computers are so fast that if a program, well, two ways. If a program runs fast, I mean, runs in a reasonable length of time, it must be doing lots of work, which means it's probably doing a lot of work, a lot of the same type work on multiple data items. Gotcha. And you can also think of it if it was if it only had to deal with one or two data items, you wouldn't write a program to do it. You just I want to be sensitive to your time too. Are we coming up? We're coming up to two o'clock, I think, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I can go over a little bit. And and by the way, I I just submit the amount of time used. So I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I submit the amount of time we actually use. Oh, okay. So it can be shorter if we run over. It gotcha. Doesn't matter. Um, slicing, so indexing is where I grab one item. Yeah. Slicing is where I want more than one item. Okay. And the funky thing about this is in Python, the second number, the second index is exclusive. You go up to that number, but it's not included. Yeah, that's a little bit beyond me. I don't, I wouldn't understand except in context, but I can, I can read about it. Yeah. It's just something you have to remember. I, I mean, it drove me crazy at first and there are reasons. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of that. In some places it actually turns out that's nice. It does that. So some of this stuff sounds kind of like if, if I'm, Hearing you're right, because it kind of reminds me a little bit of HTML, like certain rules of the road. So you learn the rules of the road, but you're eager to start driving. And then this is the kind of stuff that will just make your life easier. So be aware of it, come back to it if and when you need it. That's right. <clears throat> and a lot of times, particularly when you're starting out, if you're unsure of something, then just fire up a, an empty cell and do a little test line. Gotcha. And then you can go ahead with your program. So, and here I won't go through all of this. Often you want to format your output, meaning 
you're going to combine some some text that you want to tell the user along with values of variables that you've calculated. Gotcha. And so this just goes through one of the common ways to do that. You can just insert the value of a variable okay. in a line of text that you can get fancier. There's also little codes that you can provide to tell it exactly how wide, how much space that number should take. How so this would be like the kind of thing you work with when you're doing an interface or it's giving you some information back? Yeah, or particularly when you're worried about spacing, maybe you want to print out a table where things right. are in nice clean columns. Gotcha. Because for instance, if you print out one third, you're going to get a whole bunch of digits after yeah. the decimal. And a lot of times you don't want that. And then the last thing I run over here is since we're talking about formatting numbers, um, these were just some of the things you can do with, with numbers. You can uh, just take the integer part or you can convert an integer into a floating point number. Okay. And you can also, if you have a string yeah. of a number, you can convert that to an actual number. Okay. And this is important because there's an input statement that allows you to get allows a user to type stuff in. Gotcha. And that always ends up being a string. Interesting. Okay. And you have to convert it if you want it. All right. And here's the set of, uh, very nice if you want to. Oh, okay. Thank you. So then what should I do for next week? I'm looking at the table of contents. So the next one that I was going to go through is the is it's lists and tables and dictionaries. So chapter six through through eight. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take a look at those and then I'll play around a little bit more with uh, Jupyter Notebook. So basically what you're saying is that, um, all right, so it, if I start from, I'm just gonna go start from scratch, like if here, here I am on my own or whatever. If I wanted to come back and work with this stuff, what you're saying is that I should, let's see, there's some app running. I'm just shutting things down so that I can. Mm -hmm. yep practice kind of starting it over again. And then I'm just going to close yep. this. It looks like it will run at the same time. So basically you're saying the best thing that I should do is to just start at Anaconda Navigator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. And then in both cases, even though it's a browser-based notebook, it is looking at a directory on my computer, right? That's exactly right, yep. Okay. And you can move around, you can change a directory. So you can put notebooks in different directories. And so the, because I imported the, um, that file that you sent me into, oh, I don't like that graphic in the background. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, okay, well, how do I see the text, Yo, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, oh, I see. It's not in the background. Okay, so because when you sent this to me by message, I put it in there. I uploaded it into the, the Jupyter Notebook. It was automatically available in the Jupyter Lab. Because we were in two different um, things and it looked like it saw what you were working on. Maybe I'm not asking well, you, correctly. When you, open, when you open Jupyter Lab, it's just like opening up Word. Okay. You have, you'll have to maneuver down to where you saved that Jupyter Notebook. And, and what's the difference between Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook? Lab is a kind of a mildly improved version. Oh, okay. Okay. It allows you to open multiple just in a single browser tab and has some other nice things. 
Okay, so as long as I feel comfortable working in the um, file system within the browser, I don't really need to know the command line like folder structure on the computer, but maybe yeah. at some point in the future, we could take a look at that just so that if I had mm -hmm. to, I would know how to work around. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We can do that. Sounds good. So do you want to send me a message then uh, when you know when you want to get together again? Yeah, I mean, next week, same time works for me if it does for you. We could make it standing weekly if you're, if you're available and if I haven't annoyed you too much. No, that's fine. Uh -huh. yeah, this but I really great. appreciate it. I've learned a lot and I appreciate you um, allowing me to record. And someday mm -hmm. I'll probably ask if it's okay for me to, you know, share the recording with um, students or whatever. And I, I could talk to you about that separately. Whatever terms yeah. you would want would be fine. Or, or if you don't no, want me to share that's, it, that's fine. No, that's fine. I'm quite comfortable with sharing. I, I'm doing this. Obviously, I like the income since I'm retired, but it's also a lot. I 